Hello, and welcome to this walkthrough of the Medicare Ground Ambulance Data Collection System, or GADCS for short. Today's walkthrough has a few different components. We'll start off with a brief overview of the GADCS. Then we'll walk through the 13 sections of the GADCS, section by section, covering some key questions and other considerations. So for our first overview slide, what is the GADCS? The GADCS is a new data collection system required by Congress. Congress required CMS to collect information related to ground ambulance organization costs, revenue, and utilization, and to collect that information from representative samples of ground ambulance organizations. CMS responded to this requirement by developing the GADCS, which is both a web-based portal, which we'll walk through today, and also a set of questions and instructions. We refer to those questions and instructions as the GADCS instrument. And for those of you participating in past CMS events or preparing to participate and report data under the GADCS, you probably already have encountered a PDF version of those instructions and questions or the printable instrument. The information collected via GADCS will be used by MedPAC the Medicare Payment Advisory Commission in an analysis and report Congress required them to do on the adequacy of Medicare payment for ground ambulance services. It's important to note that for selected organizations, participation in the GADCS is required. Organizations that are selected and then do not sufficiently report information may be subject to a payment reduction for ambulance fee schedule services. This next slide walks through a high-level GADCS process. It's important to note that the exact dates for different groups of organizations selected for GADCS at different times do differ, and there's some choices that organizations have when some of these steps start. We'll cover that on the next slide. But this process is a higher-level overview, starting with step one, where CMS selects cohorts of organizations and then notifies those ground ambulance organizations. CMS has now done this a total of four times, selecting four different cohorts for the GADCS, which we refer to as year ones, two, three, and four. After organizations are selected in step one, they have 30 days after receiving that notification to provide CMS with some initial information, mostly contact information, and then a start date that determines when the next step here, step three, the data collection period begins. Step three covers a continuous 12 month period. So a whole year where organizations are collecting information but not actively reporting any information to CMS. Towards the end of that continuous 12 month data collection period, organizations will get set up to start reporting data through the web-based portal. That involves getting a user account and linking it to your ground ambulance organization. When the 12 month data collection period does end, it starts the clock on step five, which is a separate five month period during which ground ambulance organizations can report information via the web-based portal, certify those responses, and then complete their submission. In step six, Selected organizations that have not submitted a sufficient response by the end of that five month period will receive notification from CMS. The end goal, as I mentioned earlier, is for the data collected via GADCS to go to MedPAC to inform their analysis and recommendations in the report to Congress. As I mentioned earlier, CMS already selected four groups of ground ambulance organizations to participate in the GADCS, year one, two, three, and four ground ambulance organizations. As you'll see at the top of this chart, organizations in years one and year two have data collection periods, which are those 12 month long yellow bars that now coincide, and cohorts for year three and year four also have coinciding 12 month data collection periods in yellow that start 12 months later. You'll also see that year one and year two organizations will report information over overlapping five month periods as will year three and year four organizations. 
It's important to note that organizations have a choice of when to start that data collection period. And that has downstream implications for when the five month data reporting period will also begin. If your organization has a fiscal year that starts on a date other than January 1, organizations have a choice to either start the clock on January 1 or the date on which your fiscal year starts, either in 2022 for year one and year two organizations or 2023 for year three and year four organizations. If you'd like more information about the timelines for specific organizations in different context, I suggest you look at the FAQ document. I'll point you to in just a slide or two, which has some more examples. This next slide provides a quick overview of the 13 GADCX sections that we are going to walk through during the rest of the session today. The first three, one, two, and three, general survey instructions, organizational characteristics, and service area have to be completed first when you log in to the web-based portal and must be completed in that order. After those three sections are complete, you can proceed through the remaining sections in any order, starting with response time, emergency response time in section four, all the way through section 13, which covers revenue. CMS fields many questions on where to find resources related to the GADCS. The URL at the top of this screen links to the CMS GADCS website. This is a screenshot of that CMS GADCS website. You can see a lot of information here. I'll start by highlighting a few, uh, few of those resources on this first page and then scroll down a bit through more screenshots. Again, the URL for this is at the top of your screen right now. You can see a link to the FAQ up top. It's a PDF document organized by section. There are lists of ground ambulance providers and suppliers that have been selected for GADCS in years one, two, three, and four. And there are also links to that printable version of the instrument I mentioned in English and Spanish. This is the currently posted PDF of the English Medicare GADCS instrument. And as I scroll through, you'll see that the instructions that you'll see in the actual web-based instrument are all here, along with all of the questions you'll be asked along the way. So this is section two on the screen now, and section three, and so on. So if you'd like a sense of the questions before you're able to get into the system, the exact questions and all of the instructions are here in this PDF document. Scrolling down a bit, you'll find a set of tip sheets that were recently posted to the website, including the top five tips, and then some tip sheets that cover important topics, some of which Sarah, Lisa, and Christine will cover today. And then uh, down below, under the other resources heading, there's a link to that GADCS user guide. There's a link to the facilities and vehicles templates that you can use optionally to import some answers in uh, two of the sections in GADCS that we'll cover later. And then the last link I want to point to is the GADCS educational webinars here. If you click on that link, it'll take you to another page that lists planned and prior GADCS events hosted by CMS. Just scrolling down to a couple of the past events, I'm going to highlight two. Um, the first one is December 8, 2022, and this is a session overviewing, providing an overview of the data submitter role. The next week, CMS hosted on the 15th, a ground ambulance data collection system webinar on the overview of the data certifier role. I won't get much more into those two specific roles today. Do encourage you to take a look at those two videos. I am going to paraphrase some of the key points from the start of both of these videos on how to get into the system in just a second. But some of the technical issues around creating an account, linking to your NPI, uh, getting help on the IT and system side, I recommend you check out these two other sessions, which will provide much more information than we'll be able to go through during uh, today's session.
I want to be sure to cover some important points about the completeness and accuracy of your GADCS data before we get started on our walkthrough. First, you must collect and report all information asked for by the GADCS. Some of the questions that we'll cover today in the walkthrough may not be relevant to all ground ambulance organizations. And so if that's the case, they won't appear when you are actually submitting data. If a question does appear though, you are required to report a response for each question. Just as a caveat, during the walkthrough today, I'll be using some rough guesses and quick assumptions so that we can quickly move through the entire set of GADCS questions in roughly an hour and a half or so. If you're actually going through the system yourself and entering information, you should not rely on that kind of assumption or guess to be able to proceed through quickly. Instead, you are required to provide accurate and precise responses to all of the questions. There are a few exceptions where the instructions or the questions themselves allow you to make a guess or an estimate. If you don't see that kind of text though, you should not be entering an assumption guess. And the last point that's important to uh, quickly remind again that organizations that do not sufficiently report information may be subject to a 10% payment reduction for Medicare ground ambulance services that would apply over a 12 month period. All right, let's get started with our walkthrough. This is what you'll see after you get your account, assign yourself a user role, enter your username and password, take care of the multi-factor authentication or MFA step by entering that code that you get by your email. You'll end up at this landing portal screen. Now, if anyone, any of what I just said is confusing or doesn't sound familiar, please do go back and take a look at those December 8 and December 15 webinars posted on the CMS GADCS website for help getting those initial steps out of the way. What you do here is click on FFSDCS or Fee for Service Data Collection System and then go down to GADCS. Give it a minute to load. The next thing that'll pop up is this overview slide. Please do read through this your first time in the system. We covered all of this material earlier during this walkthrough. And the figure down at the bottom shows where you are at this point in the GADCS process using the same kind of step-by-step -step figure that we talked through just a couple minutes ago. You can see that step five is highlighted right here. So when you're coming into the GADCS system, you're at the point where you're, you are going to report information for one or more MPIs. So hit start or the close button to move forward here. And the first thing you'll do is to link your account to one or more MPIs. As a reminder, your NPI or National Provider Identifier is a 10 digit number that uniquely identifies your organization. CMS assigns organizations and individuals NPIs via the National Plan and Provider Enumeration System or NPPES. If you have questions about your NPI or are curious about what information is linked to your NPI, you can go to the NPPES website at nppes.cms.hhs.gov. For the purposes of the walkthrough today, we'll assume you're just entering information for one NPI. CMS realizes that some individuals may be entering information for multiple MPIs, the GADCS system can handle this. Uh, we won't review those specific steps today. I suggest you take a look at those December webinars or the GADCS user guide for more information. So for today's walkthrough, I'm going to use a sample MPI here. You would enter the NPI that was selected to participate in the GADCS. If you enter it incorrectly or there aren't the right number of digits, it'll pop up a warning. You then select your primary practice location state for the purposes of this test NPI, it's Washington state. So go ahead and enter that. And then you also need to enter your organization's name to confirm that the NPI you've entered up here is really the one you mean to be entering information for. So this is a test organization. 
So we'll have uh, that test org 110 here. But if you were to enter any other string, it would start to populate with all of the different organization names with NPIs in your practice state. So I'll go ahead and put in test org 10. And then you get a confirmation that the NPI, that's the number up here, matched up with the primary practice location state, matched up with the name, matches a selected organization, and is required to report information at this time. It's also an important uh, uh, notice to read down here. If you do have any trouble, please do click on this GADCS Help Desk link down here. We'll open up an email that you can write to the Help Desk to try to sort out whatever issue is preventing you from link to your MPI. And then click this button down here, link the selected NPI. Now, as I mentioned, for the purposes of this walkthrough, we're gonna just use one NPI. If you did have multiple to enter, you would hit yes here. We'll go ahead and hit no though. The next step is to go to the navigation screen for the GADCS, which we call the dashboard. I'll point out a couple pieces of information at the top of this screen right here. We have the MPI number, organization name, and primary practice location state that we just entered. Notes your role, which is a GADCS data submitter in this case for this test MPI. And then some important date ranges. We talked earlier about the 12 month data collection period, which for this test organization runs January 1, 2022 through December 31st, 2022. And then the data reporting period is the five months immediately following the end of the data collection period. Just to stress this one more time, the information that you're reporting at this point covers this entire now in the past continuous 12 month data collection period. So you'll have reported over 12 months and then at, during your data reporting period, you're going to report just in one submission, all of the information cumulative over this entire 12 month period. You'll see down below that there's a list of 13 sections. I mentioned earlier that we'll walk through each of these. The first three you'll see are highlighted in a different color. That's because they need to be completed first and in order. After that point, you can navigate through the remaining sections at whatever pace and order you'd like. We'll start off with section one in a second. Just want to point out along the left-hand side here, we have a couple important links. This is the dashboard. You can always get back to this screen by clicking this top link here. The add remove NPI link will take you back to the screen we were on a second ago where you can enter another NPI if you need to. There's a hardship exemption request form an informal review request form. And then this link takes you to GADCS resources, which cover many of the resources we talked about just a couple minutes ago. They're available on the CMS GADCS website. They're also available via links from within the system using this link here. This overview button will pop back up that overview slide that we had up on the screen a second ago. So let's go ahead and start in section one, which is general instructions. You can either click start here or start down at the bottom of the screen. I'll start here. Now, section one covers general instructions. Many of you who have flipped through the printable version of the instrument will notice that this text is exactly the same as um, is at the start of that printable instrument here. Please do read through these general instructions. This first page gives you some information about why CMS is collecting the data and uh, notice that you are required to complete your submission and certification of the information by the end of your data collection. So your data reporting period, which in this case is May 31st, 2023. So you'll click you verify you've read that, hit next. This next page um, has some important general rules and points of advice on the GADCS. So we do encourage you to read through this at least once. Uh, you can find a link to the downloadable uh, printable instrument here. That's the same file that's on CMS's GADCS website and also a link to that website here in case you need to find other resources. 
All right, and the last screen here is a reminder that that GADCS resources link off to the left of your screen in the navigation bar um, will get you to many of the other resources we've talked about. I do want to highlight this bold sentence here. Um, the questions that you'll answer in sections two and three, which we'll go through next, include some what we call screening questions or questions you'll answer at the start of the GADCS that determine the, what, which specific questions and even sections in some cases you'll see later on in the, in the GADCS. So you know, as an example, uh, if you answer in one of the initial questions that you have volunteers working for your organization, then in section seven, which is labor costs down the road, you'll see questions pertaining to volunteers. If you answer no, then you won't. So as a general rule, you should answer the questions in sections two and three once at the beginning of going through the GADCS, and then do what you can not to go back and change those answers. If you do change those answers, for instance, if you said, no, we don't have volunteers, then complete your data entry and then went back to section two and changed your answer to yes, we do have volunteer labor, then that would insert a new set of unanswered questions in section seven you'd need to pay attention to before you could complete your submission and certify your organization's response. In the other direction, if you answered yes, we do have volunteer labor, you entered information about volunteers at your organization in section seven, and then later went back to section two and changed your answer to no, that has runs the risk of removing some of the information you've already submitted in section seven around volunteers. So there are pop-up warnings that will appear just to make sure if you are gonna change an answer that could affect some downstream questions that you're going to do that in such a way that uh, uh, where you know that might wipe out some of your prior responses. We'll turn back to a couple of these specifically uh, in a minute or two, but this is an important flag that your answers in sections two and three have some important links to questions and sections later on. So let's move on to section two. Just as a reminder, there are two ways to navigate here. One, you can just hit next section here at the end of each section. We'll just take you to the next one. You can also return to the dashboard at any time. So let's do that now. We'll just hit dashboard. You'll see it. the system automatically saves your progress as you proceed. We've now gone through section one, so it will mark section one as complete. You can always go back and review section one if you'd like, but now you can go to section two. You can hit start here. You can also, if you do hit review, it'll take you back here. You've already verified that you've read, so we can proceed through these screens. And then instead of going back to the dashboard to get to section two, you can also just hit next section and it will start you on the first page of section two. So let's get started with our walkthrough of section two, which covers organizational characteristics. This section shouldn't take more than a few minutes to fill out. It's a set of general questions asking about how you view your organization, how you would describe it to others. In some cases, there are questions that ask about what kind of services you provide, both in terms of ground ambulance services and other services. Just a couple of reminders before we get started. First one is that when you answer questions in section two and the questions in all of the sections of the GADCS, you should keep in mind what your organization looked like or how you would describe it in the 12 month data collection period that has now passed. So in other words, if your organization maybe changed its set of services provided between last year and this year, something changed say January 1st, 2023, you'd be responding to these questions as you would back in 2022, not in 2023. So that historical look back to the now completed continuous 12 month data collection period is really important and will affect the answers some organizations will provide in section two and throughout the GADCS. Another quick reminder, this is the second of three sections that you do need to submit in order. 
So you'll after right after doing the instructions end up here and then report on your service area before you'll be able to jump around the remaining 10 sections. And finally, just as one more one more reminder, changes that you make to your responses to questions in section two and section three can have implications for the information you've already entered, or if you haven't gotten there yet, the questions you'll see in later sections. So if you do go through, complete a section, and then change an answer in section two, you may need to revisit those sections. If you're expecting to see a question, say questions about volunteer labor later on in section seven, which is on labor costs, but you don't see them there, chances are you'll have to come back to section two and change one of your answers. Again, the system will put up pop-up warnings in cases where you might be affecting information you've already submitted to the system. Let me pause here for a second and turn it over to Sarah to talk through some of the other cases where your answers to questions in section two will affect what you see later on in the GADCS. The purpose of section two is to learn more about your organization and to ensure that the questions you see later in the GADCS are more relevant to your organization. This slide shows some examples of how questions in section two will influence what you see in later sections. For example, question two in section two asks if the MPI is part of a larger parent organization that owns or operates multiple MPIs billing for ground ambulance services. If you answer yes to this question, you will see questions in later sections that ask you to estimate what portion of your parent organization's expenses in certain categories like facility expenses or supply and equipment expenses should be attributed to your MPI. If you answer no, that is if your organization only operates one MPI, then you are signaling to the GADCS that these questions don't apply to you and you won't see them in later sections. And as another example, you'll be asked in section two if your organization routinely provides ground ambulance responses to 911 calls. While EMS organizations will answer yes to this question, organizations who only provide scheduled transports will answer no. For these organizations, the GADCS will automatically skip section four, which asks about emergency response times. Similarly, you will be asked in section two if your organization uses volunteer labor, such as volunteer EMTs or volunteers who help with administrative duties. If your organization does use volunteer labor, you will see questions later on in Section 7 about the number of hours worked by volunteers and costs associated with volunteers such as, such as stipends. If you answer no, you won't see questions about volunteers. So we'll continue with our walkthrough of Section 2, hitting Start. So the first question asks whether the MPI you've linked to was used to bill Medicare for ground ambulance services during the data collection period. Now, some organizations will have ceased operations since they were selected by CMS, in some cases in 2020 or in 2021. Other organizations may still be in operation, but may not have provided any ground ambulance services for one reason or another, either they stopped providing ground ambulance services overall, or are so low volume that they just didn't have uh, transport to bill Medicare during the data collection period. If that affects your organization, you can hit no here. And this will start a series of follow-up questions that will effectively end the reporting requirement for your ground ambulance organization. I'll walk through a couple of them quickly. If you hit no, there's a confirmation question that asks you to be sure that you have not used this NPI to bill Medicare for ground ambulance services. Notes that it was the NPI was used to bill for services in 2018, which was the basis for sampling to participate in GADCS. So you can select a reason for your answer, either the NPI isn't associated with your organization, the NPI was in operation during that historical data collection period, but then wasn't used to actually bill for ground ambulance services. And the third option, the MPI was deactivated prior to, during, or after the data collection period, and then none of the above. 
If you select some of these reasons, it will prompt you to reach out to the help desk to sort out the issue. If you say that the NPI was deactivated prior to, during, or after the data collection period, or was an operation but wasn't used to bill, it brings up one more confirmation. You can say, I confirm NPI, whatever it is for your organization, was not used to bill Medicare for ground ambulance services during your data collection period. If you click here, it will basically end uh, complete your reporting requirement for this MPI. That would mean our walkthrough would be at an end. So, so we can continue. I will go back and change this answer to yes, we did use this MPI to bill Medicare for ground ambulance services. Sarah talked about uh, this parent organization question a minute ago. Some larger Primarily for-profit companies may uh, own or operate multiple MPIs. We'll say no for the purposes of this walkthrough. If you answered yes, as Sarah mentioned, it would bring up some extra questions along the way. There's also in question three, a confirmation check here to make sure that the organization you're entering information for is the right one. So you'll see your organization's actual name here instead of test org 110. You can say yes to continue. No will route you to the GADCS help desk. So we'll hit yes and then next. You'll notice that down here at the bottom, it's auto saving as I enter information. And then when I hit that next, will take me to a new page. You can go back at any point, hit by hitting previous, and your responses that you entered a second ago are still here. Now, this next uh, screen asks for some contact information. I'll put in my own name. And then I'll say that, um, uh, leave my extension off, you can put that here. So this next question, question five, is the start of a series of questions that ask about your perception of your organization in terms of its characteristics. There are no real right or wrong answers here. Uh, there are some combinations of answers that CMS thinks will be unlikely. So for the purposes of this walkthrough, I'll say that we're a government ground ambulance organization. So that means that the MPI is owned or operated by a municipal government, say a township or other municipal government. So if you were for-profit, you'd click here. Nonprofit, exclu excluding government, click here. I'll go ahead and click government here. Um, this is the question that I mentioned and Sarah mentioned earlier around volunteer labor. We'll say that, yes, we do use some volunteer labor. Hit next. So you'll see right now we're on page two of five. Hitting next will take us to page three or five. Ah, so this is a good example of an error. Um, this, uh, the system checks to make sure the phone number is uh, a reasonable one. So I will put in something And I'm in Philadelphia, which, there we go. OK, so now we're on page three of five. This is another question that asks about the general sense you have for your organization. You can say, well, we're a fire department-based ground ambulance organization, police or public safety-based, government standalone EMS agency, hospital, about 10% of ground ambulance organizations will are are uh, a Medicare provider versus supplier. So you'd click here. You can also see the definition of uh, providers of services uh, here. An independent or proprietary organization primarily providing EMS services or non-EMS services or other. Please do use other sparingly. Um, for the purposes of this walkthrough, we said a slide ago, a page ago rather, that we were government-based, so we'll be a government-based, also fire department, joint fire department, ground ambulance organization. Question eight asks whether your ground ambulance organization shared operational costs, such as building space or personnel with a fire department. This is a good question to uh, think through carefully. If you answer yes, you'll get some additional instructions along the way to be sure you're reporting information just related to your ground ambulance operations rather than 
combined, your ground ambulance and fire operation. If you say costs were not shared, then you won't see quite as many instructions. It's still important to keep in mind the fact that you should be reporting information only relevant to your ground ambulance operations. So if you are a fire department based ground ambulance organization and you have say separate budgets from your municipality, you might want to click costs were not shared here, but just be sure that none of the information in terms of utilization cost or revenue you're reporting crosses over and starts to capture costs or revenue or utilization related to your fire department operations. So I'll say yes, we share some or all costs. And then question nine asks, well, besides the fire department operations we already reported in seven, is there anything else that your organization provides in terms of services? So this is where organizations that do uh, that provide a variety of services could check off one of these other operations. I'm going to go ahead and say none here. That'll move us on to page four or five. Question 10 asks whether your organization routinely provides ground ambulance responses to 911 calls for emergency calls. I'll say yes. Do you operate land-based ambulances? I'll say yes. Do you operate water-based ambulances? One important note, this is referring specifically to water-based ambulances, not rescue vehicles that might be, uh, might be boats uh, that would then be used to get a patient to a ground ambulance for transport to the hospital. So I'll say no here. I'll say no to air ambulance. If you do operate air ambulances, it's a great example of a um, type of service that is explicitly excluded from the GADCS. So if you answer yes here, you would see instructions along the way reminding you not to include any expenses or revenue related to air ambulance. Hit next and then go to our last page here for section two. There's a question about deployment model. So you can have static, dynamic, or combined. Static means you have the same number of ground ambulance units fully staffed no matter the time or the day. Dynamic means that there's some variation over time and combined means that it's a mixture of the two. I'll go ahead and say combined. Question 15 asks if you provide around the clock 24 seven 365 service uh, in terms of emergency responses in at least some of your service area, I'll go ahead and say yes. These next couple of questions relate to paramedic intercepts. So this would be where there's a joint response and your organization or another organization is providing labor, say paramedic labor, and uh, the others providing uh, uh, actual ambulance vehicle. Medicare's definition of paramedic intercept is very specific. And as of January, 2023, applies only to certain organizations in the state of New York. So our imaginary test organization here is in the state of Washington. I'll click no. And then question 17 asks, other than CMS's formal definition, do you ever deploy ALS emergency response staff like a paramedic as a joint response to meet a basic life support ground ambulance from another organization? I'll say no here. If you said yes, then in a couple sections, there are some questions about the frequency of that happening. This last question in section two uh, is a relatively new one. CMS added it to the GADCS as part of this past year's physician fee schedule uh, final rule. And it asks whether your organization broadly contra contracted out core ground ambulance functions, like whole ambulance units or EMT staffing as a whole. The purpose of this question is to try to align instructions later on to organizations that really do pay a single amount to another organization to effectively provide their entire EMS service or a very broad swath of important inputs like all of EMT staffing. So I'll hit none of the above here. It's relatively rare for organizations to to 
need to click one of these two options. But if you do pay a flat a flat amount to, uh, through some contractual arrangement to another organization to basically respond to EMS calls for service on your behalf and then bill under your MPI, you might select one of these two top options. I'll hit none of the above. And again, now we're at the end of section two, we can return to the dashboard or click on next section. I'll go ahead and return to the dashboard and then we can navigate through section three. All right, let's start our walkthrough of section three of the GATCS, which covers your organization's service area. So we'll click on start here. Some instructions at the start of this section that has a definition of two terms. So I'll talk about them here briefly, and then we'll see how they play out in terms of questions. The first one is primary service area. And CMS defines a primary service area as a geographic area in which you're exclusively or primarily responsible for providing service at one or more levels, and where it's highly likely that the majority of your ground ambulance transport pickups occur. Now that's separate from your secondary service area, which is a term that doesn't have a completely fixed definition, but is an area that you sometimes serve, maybe through mutual or auto aid arrangements or agreements, uh, but is not is outside of your primary service area, is distinct from that primary service area. CMS is asking for information about these two categories of service areas because ground ambulance organizations often describe themselves as having a primary and then secondary service area. Before we get into the specific questions, I'll just highlight that there is some subjectivity here and there's no hard or fast rule about where your primary service area ends and where your secondary service area begins. In many cases, there are municipal boundaries, like your organization will have primary EMS responsibility for a town or a township, county, um, and you still may have some important operations outside of those municipal boundaries. You should, in general, not include areas where you only provide services in exceptional circumstances. So if there's an area you serve really once in a blue moon, you might just not include that at all. So let's go ahead and hit start. Now, the GADCS allows you to enter your service area in a couple different ways. One common theme across those ways, those methods, is that it's zip code based. Zip codes, if you've ever looked at a map of zip codes, um, do not line up neatly with almost anything. And so it's uh, sometimes uh, uh, gets a little complicated. I'll walk through one example here just by entering a simple case. Now the test NPI that we're using for this walkthrough as based in Washington State, but I don't know any zip codes in Washington State. And so I'm going to go with uh, some territory a little more familiar and closer to home in Virginia, primarily um, using some dummy zip codes just to illustrate the functionality here and be able to move forward. Of course, when you're filling out the GADCS, you'll use the actual zip codes that you provide services in, which in all or almost all cases will map up directly with your primary practice state. So to get started entering your service area, your primary service area, you need to click this add zip code button. And then you have a couple options. You can either type in zip codes manually. So I might add um, up in a zip code. You can also remove that zip code by hitting the X here. Put in another one. Also, two at a time, and then remove one or the other. So you can go back and forth here before you actually add anything. This is a preliminary step to find the zip codes you want to add. To actually add them, you click this Add button down here. And if you do that, 
you'll come back to this screen and see that your primary service area is now defined as one zip code. You can use a combination of different approaches, typing in. You can also look off of a list. So let's go ahead and click add zip codes again. And instead of clicking on type in or enter the zip code manually, we'll click on select the zip codes and uh, by state and county from a list. The MPI we're using for the walkthrough is from Washington State. So we'll go ahead and select that. In the county, um, the two zip codes that we've entered individually before are in Whatcom County. So we'll go ahead and select Whatcom County. And then over here under zip code, if you hit the down arrow, you'll see all of the zip codes in Whatcom County uh, listed out and then a check all button. If you do click check all, it'll just select all of them for you. You'll see there are 14 total zip codes in the county. Hit enter and you'll see it says only 13 of those 14 uh, were entered and you get this yellow message up here saying that basically we had already entered one by hand, 98244. And so it's going to add for us the 13 that we had not already entered. You could go in here and um, you know edit before you actually hit the add button. And let's say this one, 98295, we actually don't provide services to take us down to 12. You can add those. The 12 we just entered plus the one we already had in there brings us up to a total of 13 zip codes. And uh, we'll say this is the scope for our Washington-based ground ambulance organization. We can hit next to move on uh, to the next page. It's a couple follow-up questions. So for your primary service area, this question two asks, are you the primary emergency ground ambulance organization in most or all of your primary service area at any level? I'll go ahead and say yes. And then question three asks, what's your approximate average trip time in minutes across all service levels? It's important to note that this question is specific to your primary service area. So think about just average trip time in that primary service area, town, county, whatever it might be per your responses on the prior page. Think about the average trip time in that primary service area. This is some organizations would call this time on task. So this is the uh, the total time from the start of a response to when the unit's available to respond to another call. Go ahead and say 30 to 60 minutes. Now, this next question is a fork in the road for section three. The question asks whether you have a secondary service area. Not all organizations will think of themselves as having a secondary service area. So it's perfectly fine to answer no to this question and you'll move on. If you do have mutual or auto aid arrangements or other arrangements where you leave that primary service area to provide services in another area, an adjacent area, you can go ahead and hit yes. And I'll go ahead and hit next. Now, we're back to where we were uh, uh, two pages ago for the primary service area. Now, though, the question's asking about the zip codes for your secondary service area. The process here is very similar. I'll go ahead and select the zip codes by state and county, and uh, we'll go back to Washington here and then pick an adjacent county, so San Juan County. And let's say that our organization does uh, mutual or auto aid for that entire county. We just hit select all, five zip codes, hit enter, add, and then we can uh, hit next to submit this as our secondary service area for this organization. And then there's a similar question about average trip time. Important to recognize that this question is asking about your secondary service area, not your primary service area. So for many organizations, if you provide uh, most of your services in a primary service area, but depending on need and requests from other organizations, occasionally go outside of that area, it's probably going to be typically a little longer average trip time, although it doesn't need to be the case. So I'll go ahead and select 61 to 90 minutes, assuming that we're traveling a little longer. 
I'll turn it over to Christine to go through a couple examples of how to report your primary and secondary service areas in GATCS using zip codes. If your organization has a secondary service area, you can report some of the same zip codes for your primary and secondary service areas. Here are two examples. The one on the left is an example where an EMS agency considers its own township in dark blue as its primary service area. And it considers the next township over in light blue, where it has a mutual aid agreement, as a secondary service area. There's a boundary between zip codes that runs right along the border between the two townships. Therefore, in this scenario, it's easy to report that one zip code is the primary service area, while the second zip code is in the secondary service area. But as we know, zip codes don't always align with other boundaries, like county or township borders. If the zip code boundary crosses over two townships, like in example two, you can report both zip codes as part of your primary and secondary service areas. So we'll go ahead now and instead of going to the dashboard, well, no, maybe we should go to the dashboard just so I can show you that we'll now have completed section three. So I'll click dashboard. And you can see that before we didn't have any option other than completing sections one, two, and three in order. But now that we have completed sections one, two, and three, you can bounce around any of the remaining 10 sections in any order. You don't need to complete one before you start the other. You can have multiple in progress at the same time. So it does not take long to get through these first few sections. I'd encourage you to think about doing that up front so that you then do have flexibility to go around, uh, navigate between these different sections and enter information as you have it. So we'll go ahead and start section four, which is emergency response time. As we mentioned earlier, this section will only show up for organizations that do respond to emergency calls for services. So in section two, if you answered that question asking if you did, no, you wouldn't even see this as an option to start at this point. But we did say that we responded to emergency calls for service. So we see the start button here and I'll go ahead and start. So a quick introductory sentence here, hit start. Now, this first question asks for information about the how you measure your response time. CMS heard from many organizations that they use different approaches in terms of starting and stopping the clock for measuring response times. So this question asks, is the way that CMS is using as a default here, response time defined as the time from when the call comes into dispatch to when the ground ambulance or other EMS response vehicle arrives at the scene. You can say, yes, we do measure response times in that way or no. Just for illustrative purposes, I'll go ahead and click no, that we measure response time in some other way. This is one of many cases where the GADCS offers organizations some flexibility. You can tell CMS how you measure response time and then continue to use that approach and to report information through section four using that approach rather than having to adapt and use a new definition. So in question two, there are a couple of pre-populated examples here, different common ways that CMS has heard organizations measure response time. If neither of those fit, you can hit other and write in your own. I'll go back and hit yes though, just so we can move forward. And that's page one of three for section four. Page two asks about statistics and your organization's ability to report statistics about response time as measured by your organization. So this first question asks, do you have the ability to report detailed statistics on response time? If you answer yes, then you'll have questions framed uh, asking you for specific numbers. If you answer no, then the questions will be framed to ask you for estimates. I'll go ahead and hit yes. Now, this populates a set of questions 
first one here, 3B asks, what's the average response time for ground ambulance emergency responses in your primary service area? The emphasis on primary here, you'll see down in 3D, there's a separate question about your secondary service area. So this is again in recognition that your response time might look very different in the area where you have primary responsibility for responding to EMS calls for service versus your secondary. I'll go ahead and say that our average here is 10 minutes. There are rare cases where an organization might only respond to emergency calls for service in their secondary service area. Or maybe cases where you never respond to emergency calls for services in your secondary service area, but only in your primary service area. So there are these not applicable checkboxes you can use if that applies to your organization. CMS thinks this will be very rare though. So if you're an EMS organization providing uh, responses to emergency calls for service in your primary and secondary service areas, just leave these unchecked. Now this next question, 3C, asks you to estimate the share of your responses that take twice as long as the average you just reported in 3B. So the average you reported in 3B is 10 minutes, so twice that is 20. Question 3C is asking, what share of your responses take more than 20 minutes? Let me pause now. I'll turn it over to Sarah to go through uh, the calculations that organizations can use to come up with some of these responses. This section asks you to report the average emergency response time in your primary service area and the share of responses that take more than twice the average response time. This slide breaks down examples of how to calculate responses for both questions. On the left, this example shows how to answer question three on your average emergency response time. This hypothetical ground ambulance organization has 10 total responses during their data collection period. To get to the average response time, you add up all of the response times and divide by the number of responses, in this case 10, for an average response time of five minutes. On the right, to determine the share of responses that take more than twice the average, you multiply five minutes by two, which equals 10 minutes. In this example, only one response, the one that took 12 minutes, is greater than twice the average. Therefore, the organization would report that one out of 10 or 10% 10 of responses take more than twice the average. Great, Sarah, thank you. So I'll go ahead and enter that 15% of our responses take twice as long as this average or twice as long as 20 minutes. For many organizations, this percentage may be small. CMS is asking for this information because CMS recognizes that there are some responses that will take substantially longer than the average that you report in 3B. Now, 3D asks you for your average response time for EMS responses in your secondary service area. As with average trip time, this is probably going to be a little longer in terms of average response time in your secondary service area compared to your primary service area. I'll go ahead and enter 20 minutes here. There's a box down here that says questions 3E, F, and G are not applicable to your organization. You would have seen questions 3E, F, and G if you had answered no up here to this initial yes, no question under question three. If you said no, we weren't able to report specific statistics, you'd be asked down here to provide estimates. But we answered yes, we could, and so we have these specific responses to provide here. Go ahead and hit next. Question four asks whether your organization was required or incentivized to meet response time targets. This can be through contractual arrangements with a municipal government or from any other source. If you say yes, 
Then there's a follow-up question that asks, well, who determines the response time targets that are required or incentivized? And you can say, well, our organization sets our own target response times, our municipality or county does, or other. If these three don't apply to your organization, feel free to check other and enter it in there. If you hit no, that's the end of section four. So I'll say yes, and our local municipality does. There's a follow-up question here too, asking whether you're penalized monetarily if you exceed the response time targets, in this case, set by our local municipality. I'll go ahead and say no. All right, so that's the end of section four, and I will now navigate back to the dashboard and we'll start section five. All right, so now we'll go from the dashboard and get a start on section five, which covers ground ambulance service volume. Section five runs pretty directly into section six. So we may cover both of them um, relatively quickly together, just to give you a sense for the questions and the way that the responses in sections five and six work together. So we'll go ahead and hit start. Very straightforward start page here. And then there's a series of questions asking you to report on the volume of different types of services. Now, it's always important to read definitions uh, when filling out an instrument like this. I would say the start of section five is one place where it is really important to read these blue boxes and the definitions in the boxes to remind yourself what exactly CMS is asking you to report here. There are some important differences between how organizations that are fire department based versus not, for example, will respond to these questions. This first question asks for your total number of responses. Now, reading this definition uh, leads you to consider maybe a broader set of responses than you otherwise would initially include here. Responses should count regardless of whether a ground ambulance was deployed, regardless of whether or not a patient was transported, this should include emergency responses that did not involve a ground ambulance, say responses where uh, the call for the ambulance was canceled before the ambulance was, was deployed, cases where a supervisor or other staff arrived in a uh, quick response vehicle and, and there was no need for an ambulance. Importantly, for organizations that are fire department based or have police or other public safety functions, this number includes the total number of responses for your organization, even when it is just a fire response. So for a fire department based ground ambulance organization, let's say this number is 1000. Now question two, we've highlighted some of the terms here so you can get to the difference between question one and question two quickly. Question two asks you specifically about ground ambulance responses. Now, if you read the definition under this question, you'll see that it specifically is now referring to responses by a fully equipped and staffed ground ambulance, whether it's scheduled or not, with or without a transport, and with or without payment. So the difference between total responses above is that this is any time your organization's responding in any way to a call for service. Question two is asking about cases where the response involves a fully equipped and staffed ground ambulance. So let's say for this hypothetical fire department based organization, this is 700 ground ambulance responses. It means the difference here between 1000 and 700 or 300 responses were responses during the data collection period but did not involve a fully equipped staffed ground ambulance. That's page one of section five. We'll move on to page two. Question three asks whether your organization responds to calls for service alongside other non-transporting agencies. 
such as a local fire department or police department that is not part of your organization. So answering yes here brings up some follow-up questions. I'll go ahead and answer yes, assuming that our local police department in our municipality does also respond to some emergency calls for services. If you answer no, you'll just be able to proceed to page three. Change that back to yes and say, well, about 30% of the time, uh, police are also dispatched and arrives at the scene. There's a follow-up question 3B that asks what kind of labor the non-transporting agency provides. So let's say that the police officer maybe is an EMT and also is a police officer. We just write in police here um, to indicate that it's a, a law enforcement personnel as well. And then this next question, 3C asks, in what percentage of ground ambulance transports do you estimate the non-transporting agency continues to provide medical care in the ambulance? So let's say here, because it's a police officer, they may provide first aid, but they're not, um, they're not uh, providing care in the ambulance during the transport. All right, we can hit next. Question four in section five will only appear if you reported back in section three that you have a secondary service area. So this question is asking of all of your ground ambulance responses, we said there were 700 on the last page, two pages ago. What percentage of those 700 are in your secondary service area? So let's assume that for our fire department-based organization, of the 700 total ground ambulance responses, let's say that about 20% of them were in our secondary service area. Question five, changes gears a little bit and asks of your total ground ambulance responses, what was the number that did not result in a transport? Now, CMS has heard many reasons why uh, ambulance might be deployed, but then a patient might not be transported. Ref refusals for service, unable to locate the patient, et cetera. So this is going to be a subset of your total ground ambulance responses. These are the ground ambulance responses that didn't result in a transport. We said two pages ago that we had 700 ground ambulance responses. So we're going to say here that 200 of them did not result in a transport, even 500 that did. 5A asks, of the ground ambulance responses that did not result in a ground ambulance transport, that's the 200 we just reported, what percentage received medical treatment on site? As we just mentioned, some share of these 200 may be patients that couldn't be located. So there's no medical treatment on site. In those cases, I'll just say 50% involved medical treatment on site. That takes care of page three of five for section five, moving on to page four. Question six asks, what was the total number of ground ambulance transports for your organization during your organization's data collection period across all payer types, and regardless of levels of service or geography? Just to illustrate the navigation features here, you'll see we reported two pages ago, three now actually, that we had 700 ground ambulance responses. And on page three, we reported that 200 did not result in a transport. So that means that roughly 500 did. I'll leave it to Christine to go through some of these details in a second, but there are some scenarios where the numbers will not exactly add up. The definition of a response for the purposes of GADCS says to count one response, even if multiple vehicles were sent to the scene. But for transports, aligning with the way that claims might be submitted and paid. If one response with multiple vehicles resulted in multiple transports, you can actually have multiple transports stemming from one response. So these numbers will, for most organizations, be very close, but may not be exactly the same. 
Let's move on to question seven. So this is a good example of a question where the system, GADCS, behind the scenes is making some checks to make sure that the information you report does add up or is at least consistent with your prior responses. So question seven asks of the ground ambulance transports that you reported up in six, how many were paid either in full or in part across all payer types and regardless of levels of service or geography? One important aspect of this question is that it's asking you about the number of transports that were paid at the time you're reporting data to CMS. CMS understands that it can take months, years in some case, to be paid for a service you provide. So for this question, there's a specific reference back to the number of ground ambulance transports during your organization's 12-month data collection period, or this number 500. And this question asks, of those, how many were paid by the time you're reporting data? So some logical checks behind the scenes here. If you just reported in question six that there were 500 ground ambulance transports, and question seven is asking, of those, how many were paid? You can't have a number greater than 500 here. So if I tried to enter 501, system would do that check behind the scenes and pop up a warning in red here that the number of paid transports must be less than or equal to the number of total transports. It would be very uncommon for the number reported here to be exactly 500. That means that every transport provided during the 12-month data collection period was paid by the time you're reporting data. But it might be something like 400 that for another hundred maybe they're you know still 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 billed or but but not paid in polar in full or in part some may never be paid in full or in part but that's a good uh, maybe a good approximation for some organizations for that ratio of paid transports to total transports there's one question here on uh, section five, question eight, page five of five, that asks if you participate in standby events. We'll go ahead and say yes here. And you'll see for this organization, question nine and question 10 are not presented. And you'll see when that happens with one of these blue pop-up boxes here, just to let you know that there is a question that you might have seen on the printable instrument that you're not going to see in the web-based instrument. Questions nine and 10, ask about paramedic intercept using um, CMS's formal definition and a slightly broader definition. So because back in section two, we said we didn't provide those kinds of services, we're not seeing these questions here in section five. It's another great example of a case where if you expected to see those questions and you don't see them here, you could go back to section two and change your answer to yes, and then come back here and see them. Or vice versa, if you see a question and you weren't expecting to see it, but you remember a question that was related to it in section two, you could navigate back there and change your answer. I'll pause here and turn it over to Christine to go through some examples of the way that the different responses to questions in section five should align with one another. Here is an example to show the relationships between service categories. In this example, this hypothetical public safety ground ambulance organization had 1,000 total responses, so the organization reports 1,000 for question one. Some share of these will involve a ground ambulance and will contribute to the number of ground ambulance responses. By definition, this number will be less than or equal to reported total responses. In this case, the organization had 600 ground ambulance responses, which the organization reports in question two. The difference between 1,000 total and 600 ground ambulance responses might be due to a range of reasons. For example, since this is a public safety organization, some of the responses might have only involved a fire truck or police car and not a ground ambulance. Non-public safety organizations will likely have a similar number of total and ground ambulance responses. Moving over to the third column, 
the number of ground ambulance responses that do and don't result in a transport should be equal or greater to the number of ground ambulance responses. In this case, of the 600 ground ambulance responses, 450 calls resulted in a transport, and some of the calls involved multiple transports for a total of 485 transports. 150 calls did not result in a transport. The 150 might reflect refusals for transport, cases where a patient could not be located, or cases where medical treatment was administered at the scene. There's a separate question in Section 5 on ground ambulance responses that did not result in a transport where treatment was provided at the scene. Finally, moving to the fourth column, the number of paid ground ambulance transports will be less than or equal to the number of total ground ambulance transports. For this question, only count transports that occurred during the data collection period and that were paid in full or in part by the time you submit your information to CMS. For many ground ambulance organizations, these two numbers will be close, but not always. There are a range of reasons why your organization might not pursue payment from every patient who is transported. And even when there is an attempt to bill, a payment may not occur until after you report. In this illustrative example, the ground ambulance organization was paid in part or in full for 425 of the 485 ground ambulance transports. Great, thanks, Christine. So I'll go ahead and return to the dashboard and we can move on to section six, which covers service mix. So section six, quick introduction here saying that it's digging into the way that your mix of ground ambulance responses and ground ambulance transports might vary across type. There are some questions that allow you to estimate a range here. Just as a general rule, and this was covered in the basic instructions up in section one, but as a general rule, you are required to provide specific responses to these questions throughout all of the sections of the GADCS. Unless, as in some cases, there are exceptions where the wording of the question specifically allows for an estimate. It's also important to keep in mind as you respond to these questions that if you didn't have any services in a particular category as you're responding to these questions, rather than leave it blank, enter a zero, zero percent. That way the GADCS system can do the math behind the scenes to know that you're reporting numbers that add up to a hundred percent. If you just left it missing, then there would be no way to be sure. So we'll go ahead and hit start. Great. So question one in section six asks about the breakdown of your ground ambulance responses in two categories, emergency versus non-emergency. This blue box here includes the definition for emergency and non-emergency services from Medicare's point of view. Again, if you didn't have responses in one or the other category, you should be sure to enter a zero. Just to highlight how this would work again, if you put, um, let's say we put 100 for emergency and then anything else down here, and then try to proceed, you can see that the system will check behind the scenes and make sure that this number adds up exactly to 100%. So let's say our ratio for our hypothetical fire department-based ground ambulance organization, government organization, let's say it's 80% emergency, and 20% non-emergency. Here's another example of a warning. It says page two is not applicable when your organization does not operate water-based ambulances. Back in section two, if we had indicated that we did operate water-based ambulances, then we would see a separate page two of four here in section six asking about the breakdown of responses from water-based ambulances. Go ahead and hit next. This is page three of four in section six. Now, this table asks us for a breakdown of our total ground ambulance transports across these different categories. 
these categories use the HICPIX codes from uh, CMS to distinguish between basic life support non-emergency or an AO428, emergency AO429, advanced life support or ALS level one, emergency and non-emergency, AO426 and 27 respectively, ALS2, which is AO433, and then specialty care transporter SCT, which is AO434. Couple of quick notes on this. One code that's not here is the mileage code. So that's uh, this is asking specifically about transports, not other kinds of lines you may have billed for. There's also a set of rollovers here to get to CMS's definition of these different types of services. If there are cases where you're not sure how a specific kind of service might compare, say these are services that you were paid for by a commercial insurer or by Medicaid, use your best judgment to categorize it into one of these categories. Now's a good time to remind everyone that the GADCS's scope is not just for Medicare. So while we're using the codes under Medicare's ambulance fee schedule here, your responses to this question and all of the questions should cover all of the services you provide to your community, not just to Medicare beneficiaries or not just those ultimately paid by Medicare. One other important note here, CMS has heard from many organizations that billing companies may need to get involved in responding to a question like this one in a case where a company other than the organization itself is actually handling billing. So a billing company might provide regular reports of the volume of services broken down across HICPIX codes in this way. And that's exactly the kind of information that you might ask your billing company to provide so you can calculate these percentages. So we'll go ahead and say that, um, say we do operate in ALS level, and we reported earlier that we were primarily emergency uh, uh, compared to non-emergency. So I'll go ahead and enter 60% here, 10% here. So we don't have any ALS2 or SCT for this organization. So that brings our total up to 70. And let's say we'll split the BLS 50-50 across the remaining. Okay. So you can see that adds up to 100%. So fingers crossed when I hit next, it should go through without any trouble. All right. Question four in section six asks, thinking across all of your ground ambulance transports, what percentage are inner facility? So patients might go from facility to facility for a variety of reasons, uh, might involve um, uh, transport from one hospital to, to another, say. The CMS definition, the Medicare definition is defined right down here in the blue box. So let's say that in our case, it's a pretty small percentage, 10%. That's the end of section six. I'll go ahead and hit return to the dashboard, and then we'll tackle section seven, which is labor costs. All right, we'll start our walkthrough of section seven, which covers labor costs. Admittedly, section seven is a little longer, and for some organizations might be a little more complicated than some of the earlier sections. I'll go ahead and hit start. Now, part of what will take a little time before you actually report information in Section 7 is to read through the instructions. We'll do what we can during this next few minutes to walk through the highlights, but it really is no substitute from sitting down with the printable instrument or with the instructions up on your screen in the web-based portal and reading through the instructions. One important rule of thumb for all of Section 7 is that you should be reporting information on broad categories of your staff, not on individual people. There may be some cases where if you only have one staff member in a given category, 
de facto it will be reporting on a person by person basis. But if your organization tracks person by person compensation, say from a payroll system, and there are multiple staff members with the same role that you'd categorize in the same way, you'd first add up those amounts in terms of hours worked and total compensation before reporting them in section seven. So for larger organizations with many staff members, rather than reporting all of that information, you'll have to fill out one or two pretty straightforward tables. A couple of other important points. There are instructions in section seven about how to categorize staff. This can get a little complicated in certain situations where staff or are starting to work at your organization or leave your organization during the middle of the 12 month data collection period or when staff have multiple roles. We'll walk through a set of rules and we have a figure that I'll ask Lisa to walk through in a second that will help you get through some of those thornier situations and categorize each staff person into just a single category. Up on this screen right now is one of the most important rules and that's for staff who have EMT or response functions and also do some administrative or facilities work, it's important to consider them and to include them in a category for EMT responders, not in the administrative and facilities category. One other key rule is for staff that have both a paid role and some kind of unpaid activity, if they're volunteering beyond that, or they transition from volunteer to paid or vice versa during the, your organization's 12 month data collection period, for the purposes of GADCS, you'll need to categorize them as paid staff. Go ahead and hit start. You'll notice that there are a few places where you can access the section seven instructions. One is up here, one's down here. Both of them will pop up this set of instructions in the right bar here. So this is the section seven instructions or the high level instructions. If you hit review the instructions, it brings up some more detailed instructions related to the specific table up on the screen. Let me go through a couple of points around question one and show you the way that the table will look on the next page. And then I'll turn it over to Lisa to talk a little bit more about categorizing staff. This first table asks whether you had staff in a range of different categories. So a couple of important pointers around this table. The first you can see there's across the rows here, a breakdown between EMT and response staff and your medical director. Within EMT and response staff, there are a set of subcategories, including EMT basic, intermediate, paramedics, nurses, doctors, or other medical staff, emergency medical responder, and ground ambulance drivers. One important note, these are levels of staff that are considered by CMS. In some states, in some cases across the country, there are some other staff categories, like advanced EMTs, for instance. And the instructions as of the most recent physician fee schedule final rule ask you to sort staff into the category that you think makes the most sense using your judgment. Some of these other categories like emergency medical responders may or may not be used in some parts of the country. Across the columns, you'll see there are four options here. You have paid staff without a role supporting public safety, volunteer staff without a role supporting public safety, and then paid and volunteer staff with roles supporting public safety. We're seeing these distinctions between with and without public safety roles because we reported back in section two that this organization was fire department based. If we had said that it was a standalone ambulance organization, you would only see two columns here, and there wouldn't be this distinction between those with or without fire responsibilities. Another good example, we're seeing here that there are columns for volunteer staff. 
So I'll go ahead and say, just for the purposes of illustrating this part of the system, I'll go ahead and say that we had EMT paramedics paid and unpaid. And for now, let's just pretend like that that's it. Actually, I'll go ahead and put in, we also have them with and without public safety rules. So some paramedics only with ambulance responsibilities and some with both fire and ambulance responsibilities. Go ahead and hit save. You can always do mid page just to be sure that your responses are saved. Again, hitting next would also automatically save your responses. And let's say that I made a mistake and we actually don't have any volunteer staff. I wanna go back and fix it. So a couple ways to get back to section two, I can use this navigation bar up top and click on section two here. I can also, I was gonna say, go back to the dashboard at the bottom. That button's usually there at the end of a section. It's not here right now though. There's also this dashboard link over here in the left. So I'll go ahead and click here to go back to section two. Hit start and you'll see these are the responses we put in a while ago. So I'll flip forward until we get to page two, which says, did your organization use volunteer labor? We saw those columns in section seven because the answer here is yes. I'll go ahead and click it to no and hit save. All right, now I'll go back to the dashboard. This time I'll use this left, left navigation bar and then go into section seven, which you'll see is marked as in progress because we only made it to page two. So go back to resume. Actually hit previous here and one more time. So you'll see now that we changed that answer to no, we don't have volunteer staff. And you can see we now just have two paid staff categories. Before there were four columns, including two paid and two volunteer. And now we have just paid staff. I won't go through this now in the interest of time, but we could actually go back to section two and change our answer to that question about having shared costs with our fire department, because we're a fire department based ground ambulance organization. That would take us down to just one column here. We only have paid staff and there's no distinction between staff with and without a role in our fire department. So I'm gonna quickly go back to section two and then change that response on volunteers back to yes. So we'll see those volunteer columns again. And then using the bar up top, I'll go back to section seven. You can see there's a big exclamation point here because we're not done with section seven. All right, so we're back in this example. This is a great example of what can happen if you go back and change your responses to section two. You might remember before we made that first change, I had checked all four of the columns off here. Then we went back and changed that answer to section two that said we didn't have volunteers. Then we saved it and then clicked it back on to say we did. Well. That information I had entered about volunteers when we went back and changed to say we didn't have any, the system deleted those responses. So in this case, we'd have to go back and re-enter them. So let's say we have uh, just EMT paramedics at this organization. And for medical director, uh, let's say we have paid staff without a fire role. I'll hit next. Now this next page asks about administrative and facility staff. You'll see that there are a couple different categories here like administrative, clerical, HR, billing, IT support, management, dispatch call center, vehicle maintenance, facility maintenance, and other. If you do click other, it opens up a single free text field you can enter whatever you'd like here, but please do just uh, keep it down to one, one entry. They'll only let you add one row here. So if you need to enter multiple kinds of roles, you can separate them with semicolons. So let's say we have paid staff primarily on the administration side and they support both ground ambulance and fire. We'll say we have a fire chief, some administrative staff, dispatch and call center, just go ahead and click down the row there and um, then hit next. So there's some important considerations here around medical director. Um, 
there are a variety of ways that ground ambulance organizations have the medical direction uh, expertise they need and are required to have. If we had said we had not paid for a medical medical director, so I'll go back and say we actually don't have a medical director on staff, and then went forward again. The instrument will ask, well, does your organization contract with the medical director? This can happen sometimes if it's a fixed amount that your organization's paying for, for a medical director. You might not think about him from an accounting purpose or from a payroll purposes as an employee uh, that, you're, that you, you have uh, within your organization, but someone you contract with externally. So you could always say yes here. And then in this case, a follow-up question for 2A here will ask you, well, how much the medical direction service costs? And let's just say it's $20,000. There's a set of questions here, number three, asking why your organization doesn't report using staff in the different categories that you did not check off. So if you'll remember for the EMT response staff, we said we used paramedics exclusively across a couple different volunteer paid and then with and without fire categories. So. Uh, quite a few categories here for each of these, we can just say this labor category is not part of our ground ambulance operation, but is paid for or provided at no cost for another entity. You could say one or more of these staff do perform these functions, but we assign them to another category per the instructions. Maybe most commonly you'd say, we do not have staff in this labor category. So I'll just go ahead and click that for each of these so we can proceed. Okay, then hit next. Now we'll get into questions that pop up tables that are informed by our responses in the prior section. So you'll remember that we reported having paid paramedics with and without fire rolls. We unchecked the medical director button and ultimately entered a single contracted amount. So they're not appearing here in this table. So because we only have staff in those two categories, we only reported in that initial table having staff in two categories, there are only two rows in this table. And you can see across the columns, this table is asking for information about total annual compensation, total hours worked, and then total hours worked broken up into three different categories. One of them is related to ground ambulance operations, one is related to fire, police, or other public safety operations. And then the third is for all other responsibilities. For the paramedics, we indicated do not have a fire, police, or other public safety role. This middle column's grayed out. This column's grayed out because it automatically is calculated from the information you'll enter in the columns that aren't grayed out. I'll pause here and turn it over to Lisa to walk through how organizations can categorize their staff into different labor categories. This chart walks through the Section 7 instructions on categorizing your staff into labor categories step by step with a focus on how to categorize staff with multiple responsibilities. It's important that each staff member is assigned to just one labor category for the purposes of reporting throughout Section 7, even if they perform multiple roles in your organization. Assigning staff members to just one category lowers the risk of double counting and eliminates the need to split hours and compensation for a single person across multiple categories for reporting. The instrument includes detailed instructions on how to assign each staff member into a single labor category. Here, we distill the most important instructions down to a flowchart. The instructions can be simplified to three main questions. First, does the staff member have ground ambulance responsibilities at your organization such that they should be included for reporting? If no, then do not report their compensation or hours. If yes, was that person paid staff at your organization? If they were paid staff at any time during the reporting period, 
including transition from paid to volunteer or from volunteer to paid, include them as paid staff. If they were not paid staff, include them in a volunteer category. Finally, did they have an EMT response role at your organization? You will be asked to categorize both paid and volunteer staff based on their EMT response role. If they have an EMT response role, you should categorize based on their EMT response level or role at the start of your data collection period. If they did not have an EMT response role during your data collection period, you will select an administration or facilities category based on their primary role during your data collection period. For EMTs or other responders who also have an administrative role or help with things like vehicle or facility maintenance, please classify them in the relevant response role. Answering these three questions for each of your staff members will tell you how they should be categorized for the purposes of reporting. Section 7 asks you to report information aggregated or added up at the labor category level. So, you'll report hours worked and total compensation for all of your EMT basic staff in a single table row, not person by person. This diagram summarizes the kinds of information you'll report for different labor categories. For each paid and volunteer staff, this includes reporting total hours worked annually related to supporting ground ambulance operations, if applicable, for public safety organizations, total hours worked related to fire, police, or other public safety duties. Note that only public safety organizations would be asked to report hours associated with public safety activities. Total hours worked annually related to all other responsibilities. Note that the GADCS will automatically calculate total hours worked annually across all staff members in a category. So you can verify and compare this number with your own record keeping. For paid staff categories, you'll report total annual compensation for staff you assign to that category. For volunteer staff, you'll be asked to report the total number of individuals who were volunteers and the total costs related to volunteers. This may include stipends, allowances, or other benefits. Note that staff who were considered paid staff at any point during your data collection period will be included in the paid staff categories. So you'll notice down at the bottom of the screen, there's another one of these blue boxes indicating that there's a question that wasn't asked because in section two, we said we weren't part of a larger parent organization. That will come up again and again as we go through the, the instrument. Uh, again, if you had gone back to section two and answered that question, yes, then you would be asked to input an allocated cost for labor at that broader parent organization level, but again, not appearing here on page five in section seven. So go ahead and enter some, um, some numbers here so we can proceed. Let's say that our paramedics make $50,000 and we have two of them in each of these categories. So one important instruction, if you click on the instructions here and read through them here, you'll find a definition of total annual compensation. This is a very broad amount that covers not just salary or wages, but benefits too. and and basically the total compensation over the entire 12 month data collection period for your staff in that category. So let's assume that our two EMT paramedics that do not have a fire role worked full time and made $50,000 each. What's important is that we're not gonna report them on separate rows here. We include them in one row and then add them up. So two times 50,000 is $100,000. So I'll enter that information right here. Let's say we also have two EMT paramedics that are firefighters as well. So let's say they have the same total compensation. I'll enter $100,000 here as well. So this next column 
asks for the total hours worked annually related to ground ambulance operations. Full-time is about 2,000 hours a year. So we have two staff at full-time. So I'll go ahead and enter 4,000 hours. You can see that this column here automatically calculates the total we've reported so far. For the EMT paramedics, the paramedics that are also firefighters, let's assume that they spend half of their time on ground ambulance responsibilities and half of their time on fire responsibilities. So I'll go ahead and enter 2,000 here. So that's 1,000 each. You'll see that these staff are all working full time, but we have a disconnect in terms of the total hours worked here. And that's because we can add an additional $2,000 here, sorry, hours here, in terms of total hours worked annually related to fire, police, or other public safety operations. So now we have four staff total reported, total annual compensation, $50,000 each across the two categories, two each is $200,000 and we have four full-time staff contributing a total of 8,000 hours. Another reminder, if you went back and looked at these instructions carefully, there are some categories, for instance, air, ambulance services, fundraising, services in another healthcare delivery system, say some of the, the paramedics spend time working in a clinic or a hospital doing something other than providing ground ambulance services. Those are out of scope for the GADCS. Because this column asks around fire services, they are, that is in scope and you should tally up and report the hours worked for fire activities. But there are some things that should go in this third column. Let's say that all of the staff spent 40 hours a year doing fundraising. So fundraising is one of those categories that are explicitly excluded down here under the instructions for total hours worked annually. So you could go in and say, okay, well, we have 40 hours times two, so that's 80. 40 hours times two is 80. And then that will update the total here to report a total full-time hours worked each of 2040. All right, let's hit next here. This next page asks for very similar information, but across all of your administrative and facility staff. I'll go back a couple pages just to show you that initially you're reporting whether you have administrative and facility staff in different categories. For instance, there's a separate row here for management versus dispatch versus vehicle maintenance, et cetera. But at the point where you're actually going to report total compensation and hours worked, it's all add up, add, added up into one row. And the reason there is ma mainly one of burden that CMS didn't want organizations to have to try to figure out hours worked and compensation across all of those different categories. For many smaller organizations, the same single staff member might have responsibilities across many of those different administrative and facilities activities. So rather than ask organizations to try to break it out, it's just reported in a single row in this way. So let's assume there are two administrative staff that say both work full-time and both support, as we reported back at the start of section seven, both fire and ambulance operations. So let's say these staff make $40,000 a year and there are two of them. So we'll enter $80,000 total. And then similarly, we'll enter information on the hours worked here. So we'll say here there were zero hours worked on other responsibilities. All of their time is spent either supporting ground ambulance or fire activities. And let's say that we have 2,000 hours in each of these categories. So that's half time on ground ambulance, half time on, on fire times two, gets us back up to that 2,000 hours. So again, we have two FTEs here and $80,000 in total compensation. Again, to review any of these instructions on how to actually 
calculate these numbers, come up with them, what's in scope and out of scope. There's a whole bank of instructions over here on the right that you can refer to. The other headings that might be relevant in this case are how to report total hours worked for staff with and without fire, police, or other public safety responsibilities. And then down here at the bottom, there's a list of things that you need to exclude from uh, these two columns of hours worked and are in this rightmost total hours work related to all other responsibilities. We'll talk a little bit more about allocation later in the walkthrough today, but now's a great time to bring up the concept and provide some advice on how to think about staff that have both ground ambulance and other responsibilities. You know, for many organizations with firefighter EMTs, it's hard to think about how the time that they work at your organization should be split between ground ambulance and fire activities. It is though really important that your organization does this when reporting information to GADCS. Otherwise, if you report the total cost, that ground ambulance piece will look uh, like it involves a lot more time and compensation than it actually does. Organizations have a range of ways to think about splitting up hours worked. In many cases, hours worked won't actually be tracked differently, but you could look at a ratio of responses, separating out medical responses from fire responses, say and then using that fraction as a way to separate out hours work between those two categories. In some cases, if the balance of responses was roughly 50-50, you might, as we did in this example, report total hours worked broken out roughly evenly between the two categories. In some cases, you'll have a staff category where most of the most of their responsibilities and time is in one of the two columns here. And you can go ahead and use a basis to split or allocate those hours across these two categories that makes the most sense for your organization. So let's go ahead and move on to page seven of 10 in section seven. In seven two, this question two asks you whether you have one or more staff members, individual staff members, devoting at least half time or a thousand hours annually or approximately 20 hours a week to these activities. So let's say that one of those administrative staff that we mentioned uh, on the last page does work billing more than half time. So we'll indicate yes here and no for the rest of these. We still do these other activities, but not more than a half an FTE on any of them for an individual person. Now we went back and said that we did have some volunteers. So now the instrument's going to ask us how many individuals were EMT response volunteers. Let's go ahead and enter four. Now this is, we were reported in that very first table in section seven that we only had staff in the paramedic category. These are volunteers, so there's no question in this table asking us for total compensation. This is just asking us about hours worked. In order to move forward quickly, I'll put in the same numbers we used for other prior page. Of course, you would tailor these so that they would match the actual hours worked at your organization. Go ahead, hit next. In the very first table in section seven, we said we didn't have any volunteers in the administration or facilities category. So this pop-up is telling us that we don't have any questions to answer on this page. Now CMS recognizes that organizations sometimes do provide some uh, payments to volunteers in the form of stipends or honoraria benefits, other kinds of compensation. If that applies to your organization, you can say yes here. And then there's a question asking for the total comp the, that total amount summed up over all of your volunteers. I'll just put in $5,000 here. One other note before we finish up section seven, uh, there is a 
question here that asks specifically about medical director labor if the medical director volunteers. So there are a couple of different places where, depending on how what your relationship looks like between your organization and its medical director, a couple of different places where you might enter information about your medical director's hours worked and in the prior sections, compensation. So congratulations for making it through section seven. Uh, I encourage you to take a look at those instructions before you start reporting information and um, to think carefully through the way that the table will look and just understand how many rows your organization and columns your organization will have to have to report. This is a great example of a section that works much more smoothly in the web-based version of the GADCS that customizes the questions you're asked to your prior responses compared to the printable version. The printable version in that PDF file has all of the rows and columns in there because it needs to address every scenario. But given the way that Section 7 builds over time in the web-based version, you should only expect to see the columns and rows that apply to your organization. So we'll return to the dashboard and then get ready to dive into Section 8 on facilities costs. All right, we're back at the dashboard more than halfway through the total GADCS and through Section 7. So now we'll pick up with Section 8, which is facilities costs. A lot of similarities between Section 8 and Section 9. So I'll review Section 8 in a little more detail and then cruise through Section 9 a little more quickly. It's important to note that there is a decision that organizations need to make before getting too far into Section 8 or Section 9. There's an option to use an Excel-based template to enter your information into that template and then to import the file into the GADCS, or to go through, as we've been going through, page by page through the system itself and entering information directly. If you hit Start, you'll see that the Section 8 introduction walks you through the basic choice here and then has an option that presents you to either enter directly just through, the, through your web browser, as we've been doing, or to upload a file. I'm going to pause here and let Sarah talk through some of the considerations around using the optional template or entering directly through the GATCS portal. The purpose of Section 8 is to learn more about the facilities your organization uses in its ground ambulance operations. Some organizations will have just one or two facilities, while others will have many. The GADCS requires information to be listed separately for each facility, and you will have the option to input this information directly into the web-based interface or to input information into an Excel template, which can then be uploaded into the GADCS. Regardless of which path you choose, you will be able to review your answers in the web-based portal and then complete the rest of the section there as well. Use of the templates is completely optional, and there are no hard and fast rules about when to use them. In general, it may make more sense for organizations to use the templates if they have more than five facilities. In general, the templates require a little more upfront work, but may save time if you have a lot of information to input. For more information on when and how to use templates, you can refer to a previous webinar on using facility and vehicle templates, as well as a selection of previous webinars on other topics at the website listed on the screen. You can also find this in other past webinars on the GADCS by Googling CMS Ambulance Services Center and clicking on Ambulance Events. Great, thanks, Sarah. I'm gonna go ahead and click enter directly and we'll walk through the version of this uh, section eight and section nine where we're just entering the information in directly. So the very first question asks how many facilities you have. As with many of the other questions in the GADCS, there's a specific, um, a specific instruction that they are related to your ground ambulance operations. So if you're a 
fire department based ground ambulance organization and you have some facilities that are purely fire in function, um, then you would not include them in this total. So let's say we have two, let's say we have a, a administrative building where things like billing, dispatch happens, and then a, a, a station where we house the fire trucks and ambulances and, and dispatch out of. So we'll say two. Now, the next question that pops up, we'll ask for a name. This name is for your reference only. What is under administration and station? One of the considerations in using the templates or just directly entering information comes down to the number of rows you're going to have here. For facilities, I mean, if you did have uh, 20, 30 facilities, it might be easier to enter all that information in a spreadsheet and then importing it. With just two, though, this is probably a lot more straightforward just to type in the information directly. No matter whether you use the templates or are entering this information directly, there are some links between these questions you're answering about the total number of facilities and the names. If I were to go and change this to three, you'll see it adds a row. If I were to change it from three to one though, you'll see that it would take one of the rows where I've already entered information away. And so this is an example of this, a loss of data warning that pops up just to make sure this is really what you want to do. And that by hitting yes, you're gonna lose a row. I'll go ahead and hit yes, just you'll see what happens. It takes that second station away. I can go back and change that to two. It'll bring it back as blank and I can go ahead and re-enter station. All right, moving on to section eight, question three. There's some initial questions here asking for each of the facilities separately, whether it was rented or leased, mortgaged, owned outright, owned outright or donated, along with the square footage, and the percent of that square footage used for ground ambulance purposes. So as I mentioned earlier, this broader topic of determining what percentage is related to ground ambulance service, we call allocation. And it can get uh, uh, not, not difficult, but it can take some thinking ahead of time to come up with an approach that works for your organization and that most closely aligns the information you're going to be reporting to GADCS with the actual share of, in this case, facility expenses across the different purposes, the different services that your organization provides. So for the administration building, you might come up with one share. For the station, you might come up with another. I'll pause here, turn it back over to Sarah to walk through a couple of basic considerations and examples around allocation. It's important to remember that the scope of GADCS is limited to your organization's ground ambulance costs and revenue. That's the scope that Congress laid out and CMS implemented, and it makes sense because the GADCS data are going to be used by MedPAC to assess the adequacy of Medicare payment rates for ground ambulance services. We use the term allocation to describe the process of divvying up costs that are related to ground ambulance operations and those which are not. We'll also sometimes use the term allocation factor, which refers to the specific share of a total amount that your organization determines is related to ground ambulance operations. The concept of allocation is important in a few places throughout the GADCS. For example, when considering facilities costs in section eight, some of your facilities may be used for both ground ambulance activities and other types of activities such as fire, police, hospital, or government activities. In general, you can use any reasonable data-driven and explainable method to estimate the percentage of facility space that is ground ambulance related. Some strategies you could use to determine the allocation factor for, for facilities are to estimate the percentage of physical space used for ground ambulances, the percentage of time a certain space is used for ground ambulance activities, the percentage of staff that use the space that primarily have ground ambulance duties, 
or if you're a public safety organization, you could estimate the percentage of responses you go on that are primarily medical or EMS related as opposed to primarily fire or police related. Next, we have an example of how a fire department might use different allocation factors for different buildings. For the garage, they chose the percent of square footage occupied by ground ambulances. Since the ground ambulances take up about 25% of the space, they reported that 25% of the facility was ground ambulance related. The organization chose a different allocation strategy for the administration building because all of the rooms in the building are used for both ground ambulance and fire operations, and there isn't a straightforward way to allocate based on space. The organization chose instead to use a response-based allocation method. They determined that 70% of their responses were medical related versus 30% fire. So they reported that 70% of the facility was ground ambulance related. Thanks, Sarah. So I'll go ahead and assume that we own our administrative building outright and that we are renting our station. So for square footage, I'll uh, show you one way that Sarah alluded to. Let's say it's a big building with and 50,000 square feet. And let's say that's our city hall or a major administrative building that would cover a, many different functions for the municipality. Only a small share, say dispatch and billing and maybe some clerical space would be around ground ambulance, would be related to ground ambulance services. So doing some math about the square footage involved, let's say we ballpark that at 10%. The station might be smaller, say 10,000 square feet. And let's say that that is shared between fire and ambulance, and that using an approach that's anchored on measurable data, as Sarah mentioned, we determine that half of that is related to ground ambulance services. Now, this way of reporting it makes a lot of sense. And if you have a choice in how to report, CMS prefers that you report a total and a share. In some cases, though, you'll already have calculated the specific amount that is related to ground ambulance operations. So let's say for the purposes of this administrative building that you already knew that the components that were related to ground ambulance were 5,000 square feet. If you wanted to, you could do the math yourself instead of leaving the GADCS to do it for you behind the scenes. Instead of 10% of 50,000, you could go ahead and enter 5,000 square feet, and then you would have to put 100% related to ground ambulance. You'll notice the response is the same number of total square feet either way, but in this case, the system will calculate it for you behind the scenes. All right, on section eight, page two, there's a question about whether your organization calculated annual depreciation expenses for some or all of your facilities. So we indicated earlier that the administrative building was owned outright. We'll go ahead and say yes, that we do calculate depreciation. It's a great point to remind organizations that you can generally use your your organization's current accounting approach when reporting information to GADCS. So many organizations will depreciate uh, uh, facilities, vehicles, other capital expenses. Some, primarily smaller organizations, may not and may handle those kinds of big purchases on a cash basis. If that applies to your organization and you're buying a facility or vehicle on a cash basis, then you can still report that expense in the GADCS, but only if you made that acquisition during your organization's 12-month data collection period. In general, organizations will depreciate those larger expenses, and so you'll have an uh, annual amount that you can either calculate for the purposes of reporting to GADCS or that you've already accounted. Uh, already calculated for accounting purposes. 
All right, so we have our two facilities, an administrative building and a station. We said we did calculate annual depreciation expenses. I'll put $30,000 here just to fill something in. This other annual costs of ownership column is where you can put other amounts that aren't strictly a depreciation expense, or if you're on a cash basis and you purchase the facility or an acquisition cost. I'll just leave this as zero right now. Things like mortgage interest can go in this, uh, in this column. If you do either have a donated facility or you report having no annual costs associated with the facility, there is a checkbox here that you'll need to uh, click on to confirm that you don't have any annual expenses around that facility. Let's say for the station, our annual rental costs are, well, we'll go $40,000. Um, so that will complete this page. I will take one minute to note that this annual depreciation expense for the administrative building of $30,000, it's really important that that match up with how you decided to report the information back here on this last page. So this 10% gets applied to that total expense. Just thinking through it as I was putting in that example that this $30,000 seems on the light side. So you know, maybe I made a mistake here. And what I should have done was to put that we already did that allocation in our, on our own and that we're reporting a 5,000 square foot amount of space in the administrative building that is 100% ground ambulance. And then here, we could assume the actual total depreciation expense for the total administrative building is, this is only a tenth of it, it really is $300,000, but we've gone ahead and applied that, um, that math here too to report just a ground ambulance associated annual depreciation expense. Let's take a quick break from um, walking through sections eight and nine to take a look at the templates for organizations that choose to use them. I'm back at the uh, CMS GADCS website here that we reviewed earlier in the walkthrough. I'm going to scroll down to look at the two uh, links to the facilities template for section eight and the vehicles template for section nine. Go ahead and click on facilities template here. That'll download it and we'll open it up and take a look. So when you open up the Excel file, you'll see a README template, which this is the README um, page for the Section 8 template for, for facilities. And you'll see a couple of uh, quick overview points and then instructions. It's really important to read through the instructions because they tell you what kinds of rules the GADCS system is going to look for when you upload your completed template. So for instance, you can check off for each row, which in the template is, a, is an individual facility. You can enter yes for only one of these four columns in row 11 here, rent or leased, mortgaged, owned, or donated. So these rules are the same kinds of rules, the exact same rules actually, that apply if you're entering information facility by facility in the GADCS via the web portal. Those same rules, they'll get checked when you upload this completed template. So important to read through these directions and instructions and make sure that you're entering information in that way. Under the template column list portion of the README tab, you'll see each of the columns, their heading, and then a description. And then the example uh, block of text down here just points you to the next tab, which is an example. Uh, for a four facility organization, a fire station, an administrative building, and two garages, you can see that there's that bank of questions on rent, leased, mortgaged, owned, or donated, square footage, and then the percent of that square footage uh, associated with ground ambulance services, and then annual cost of ownership in different categories. The last tab it's called facilities, and this is a blank template that you'll fill out if you do choose to use the templates. Each facility will get its own row. You'd enter a name here and then enter information across these columns following the instructions in the README file. 
All right, so clicking through to the last page in section eight, this page asks for some information on expenses across all of your facilities combined. So the last table was asking for information on a facility to facility basis, one at a time. This is asking across all of your facilities for some information on insurance costs, facilities maintenance and improvement costs, utilities, and taxes. So I'll put in we didn't pay any taxes. This is a good test. I'm actually not sure if you have to put in a percentage there. It looks like you do. So we'll say for insurance costs, 10,000. Again, it's important that this, if you are allocating down to a ground ambulance portion of that big administrative building, it's important that this reflect that allocation as well. We'll say that's 100%. Uh, facilities and ma maintenance and improvements, let's say $20,000. Here, let's say that part of the improvements were for the uh, related to fire. So we might say that this is 70%. We'd look at the amounts paid for different, uh, different maintenance and improvement costs and uh, approximate this percent. For utility costs, let's put $20,000 here too. And then let's say that, well, for the administrative building, we've we've decided it's entirely ground ambulance because we've already done the allocation. For the station, let's say we're assuming it's a 50-50 split. And of this, let's say that's $16,000 are from that station and $4,000 are from that allocated share of the administrative building. So if $16,000 were from the station and we were splitting it 50-50, that would be 8,000 plus the 4,000 left over. So we put $12,000 here. Oh. <laughs> so I am having trouble following my own direction. So we could put $12,000 here and then 100%. All right, that's it for section eight. We'll hit the dashboard and then go on quickly through section nine. Section nine looks very similar to section eight in a lot of respects. Right off the bat, there's this choice between uploading a file and entering directly, just like we had in section, uh, in section eight. Sarah did a great job talking about that distinction earlier, so we won't revisit here, but it's a good time to point out that there is a separate webinar that CMS recorded uh, uh, a couple months ago now on using those templates. So as a reminder, if you'd like more information about the templates and how to use them, uh, there's more resources on that CMS GADCS website. I'll go ahead and hit enter directly. Section 10 asks about expenses associated with equipment, consumables, and supplies. So a couple of bullet points here before you enter the section. It's a reminder to basically use your organization's current accounting practices in terms of distinguishing between um, expenses that are or aren't uh, capitalized um, and to think about that amount of an expense that's related to your ground ambulance operations. So if you are a fire department-based ground ambulance organization or a hospital-based ground ambulance organization, just be sure that the numbers you report here, the expenses you report in section 10, one way or the other, reflect just that ground ambulance perspective. And as Sarah mentioned a little earlier, the two main ways to do that are to do the math yourself and be sure that the number, the numbers you report are just for ground ambulance, or you can report a total expense and then a share of that total expense that are associated with. Uh, that's associated with ground ambulance operations. So there are a couple different sections to section 10 subsections. We walk through different categories of medical equipment and supplies and non-medical equipment and supplies. And then each of those are split into two uh, components, one for capital metal equi medical equipment or non-medical equipment, and the other for non-capital equipment. So we start off with section 10.1, question one. Very first question is whether your organization calculated annual depreciation expenses 
for some or all of your capital medical equipment. This might be ventilators, power lifts, defibrillators, um, expensive uh, uh, medical equipment that many organizations would, uh, would depreciate over time. So I'll go ahead and say yes. Now, unlike sections eight and nine, Section 10 doesn't ask you to report information for individual pieces of equipment. Instead, it's asking for a total amount over all of it. So through your accounting system or other record system, um, you could tally up the uh, depreciation expenses across all of your uh, medical equipment. So let's say this is $30,000. If you did purchase medical equipment that you did not calculate annual depreciation expenses for, you could report that here. I'll just assume that we did capitalize all of those purchases and enter a zero. There's a separate question down here for renting and or interest payments related to capital, capital medical equipment. I'll assume that we don't have any but your organization very well may. There's a separate line here for maintenance, certification, and service costs. So much of this equipment is serviced and, and, and inspected, certified on a regular basis. I'll say this is $10,000. Now here's this question on allocation. You can see that question, sub, sub question C here asks for the percentage of capital medical equipment attributable to ground ambulance services. In this case, because we're talking about medical equipment, odds are for many organizations, most of it, if not all of it, will be related to ground ambulance operations. But you could imagine where you have some equipment that might be shared between a ground and air ambulance operation, say or maybe equipment that's used in a ER setting and then also used by EMS on ambulances. So in this case, we'll assume that that doesn't happen and that 100% of this capital medical equipment expense is associated with our ground ambulance operation. There's a separate question here asking whether your organization had costs associated with medications. If you answer no, there's a follow-up question asking why that's the case. CMS heard that some organizations receive medica medications for free or stocked by local hospitals or receive them in some other way. I'll go ahead and say, yes, we can. There's a follow-up question here asking whether your organization can separately report on those costs aside from other medical supplies and consumables. I'll say, yes. And then there's a question asking for those total costs. I'll say it's $20,000. And that's across all medications for the entire 12 month period. Now we're into 10.1, which is still medical equipment and supplies, but now we're into the um, uh, equipment and supplies you're purchasing out right here. So this is um, smaller ticket items, bandages, gloves, oxygen, et cetera. Um, in this case, it's important to be sure you're not double counting anything and that expenses that you're reporting as you answer question three here don't overlap with questions you've reported uh, in the earlier questions in section 10. I'll say this is $30,000. Here again is one of these allocation questions. And as with the capital medical equipment question, it's unlikely that this will be much below 100% for most organizations, although there are some exceptions. I'll go ahead and say 100% here too. So while we're here and talking about these allocation questions, before we get into the non-medical equipment where that allocation factor might vary a little bit, I'll pause, turn it back over to Sarah to walk through some specifics on allocation using some Section 10 examples. Some organizations will need to allocate expenses reported in Section 10. This table covers the main Section 10 expense categories and lists examples of the expenses that may require allocation. 
For example, capital medical equipment, medications, and medical supplies are generally 100% generally related to your organization's ground ambulance services. The only exception would be if you share some medication, equipment, or supplies with non-ground ambulance services in your hospital or another provider organization. And for organizations that provide multiple types of services, such as public safety organizations, Shared capital non-medical equipment, such as computers, may need to be allocated. As in other sections, you have the flexibility to select your own allocation methods that may vary across sections or even across questions within a section. All right, let's dive back in and finish out section 10 here. I'll hit next. Now we'll go into non-medical equipment and supplies. The format here is very similar to what we just went through for medical equipment and supplies. The one difference, as we just talked through, is that some of the equipment and supplies for fire department-based organizations and organizations providing other services will likely be more shared than not, as was the case in the medical equipment and supplies. So I'll go ahead and say, yes, we did calculate annual depreciation expenses for non-medical equipment furniture, IT systems, et cetera, I'll say that was $15,000. No purchases within the data collection period that weren't depreciated and reflected above. No expenses related to renting and or interest payments. And for maintenance and certification costs here, I'm gonna put a zero because let's assume it's mostly IT and uh, uh, furniture, other kinds of equipment that might not need a regular regular service or certification. Now here's that allocation question for non-medical capital equip, uh, equipment. And here in our fire department based example, I'll go ahead and enter 50%. Different ways to calculate this allocation factor, you could go on a share of operating budget or um, as a share of square footage in some cases, I think through the different alternatives and use the approach that makes the most sense for your organization. There's a separate question here in section 10.2, question two, asking about uniforms. For some organizations, this will be an expense. For others, it may not be. Go ahead and put $3,000 in for uniforms. And then as in all of the other questions in this section, there's a follow-up question asking what share of that expense is related to ground ambulance services. So if uniforms expenses cover both fire and ambulance staff, there's a need to either do the math here and enter $3,000 and 100%, or if the factor was 50%, you could enter $6,000 and 50%. Just to show how you can mix and match, I'll go ahead and enter $3,000 and 100% in this case, having already done the math. It's also a field here for all other non-medical supplies. This is office supplies, postage, etc. cetera. $3,000 here. And this is also really 6,000, but I've already multiplied by 50%. Just to show how you can mix and match, really, we can actually enter 6,000 here and enter 50%. That is absolutely equivalent from the GADCS perspective. Last question here only pops up for organizations that are part, for MPIs that are part of a larger parent organization. There's a question for that would have asked you to report an allocated share of non-medical equipment and supply expenses allocated down from that larger parent organization level. So that'll wrap up section 10. We'll return to the dashboard. We'll click on section 11, other costs. Section 11 is a kind of catch-all. If there are expenses that you're tracking in your, your budget, your accounting system, any kind of expense that you haven't reported in sections seven through 10, you should find a home for it in section 11. It's really important that the scope of expenses that you're reporting via GDCS cover all of the expenses associated with operating your ground ambulance operation. So think about anything that might've been left out and section 11 can for sure accommodate it. I'll walk through some 
a couple of different categories of those expenses. First one has to do with outside contracted services. So if you don't handle billing or accounting or vehicle maintenance, dispatch, facilities maintenance, IT, if any of those services you're contracting out to a different company and you haven't reported them yet, question one in section 11 is the place to do that. So a couple of different components here. There's a first a checkbox that says contracted service during your organization's data collection period. And then for the ones that you check off, you can enter a total cost for the service. That's the amount of the contract for the 12 month data reporting period, data collection period rather. And then an amount attributable to ground ambulance services. So let's say that our organization does contract out billing and pays $50,000 a year. We're only billing for ambulance services. So let's say that's 100%. Let's say we also, though, contract out dispatch to um, an adjacent municipality. Let's say we chip in and pay $60,000 a year for that. But that also covers fire dispatching. And let's say our ratio of medical to five, medical to total calls is roughly 50%. Might put 50% down as the percent attributable to ground ambulance services. So those kinds of contracted services cover a lot of different ground. If there's a kind of contracted service you have that's not in this list, you can always check the other box here and then write in a specification. As in some of the other write-in questions, there's only one row here. So if you have multiple you need to enter, you can use a semicolon to separate different responses. Go ahead and hit next. Now this is a long page that scrolls down through many different categories of other expenses, other costs your organization might have that you haven't reported up to this point in the instrument. Things like laundry, biohazard waste, travel, dues, subscriptions, board of directors, trustee expenses, event and meeting costs, etc. It's important to remind you to only include expenses in this section 11 that you haven't reported up to this point in one of the other sections. So let's say we do have a couple of these. All of the ones that you check off will ask you to report an expense on the next page. So let's say we have um, uh, IT, I checked off biohazard up here, and I'll do one more, let's say fees for toll roads. There's also a um, write-in field here. If there's an expense you want to make sure you include and it hasn't, hasn't been asked up to this point and isn't in this list, you can write it in here. So then we'll hit next. Now I check three. So you'll see there are three rows here in section 11, question four. And for each of those, it's asking me for an expense. I'll go ahead and enter $1,000 for biohazard waste and medication removal fees, $5,000 for IT, and $1,000 for tolls. The biohazard waste is entirely ambulance. IT system covers both ambulance and fire. And the fees for toll roads actually may be paid a little more often for fire than for ambulance. So I'll go ahead and enter in those percentages. It's another case where had we reported that we were an NPI that was owned and operated by a larger parent organization, like a, a larger for-profit company, there would be a question five here asking for a final amount um, for allocated other costs. So that wraps up section 11. And if you've gotten to this point in the GIDCS and you have an expense you feel like you have not reported yet, I'd hit the previous button, go back and change one of your earlier answers. You can always go back and check this other box and enter it in. You want to make sure that the total amount here that you've reported up to this point reflects all of the expenses for operating for running your ground ambulance organization. Go ahead. This is many people's favorite section coming up next, section 12, because it's exactly one question. And 
here it's just uh, very directly the total expenses to operate your organization. Now this is one of just two places in the instrument where the expenses explicitly include the scope for this question explicitly in includes your entire operation. So that means if you are a fire department based ground ambulance organization, these expenses are for your overall operation, including that entire fire activity. So let's say it's a million dollars here. If you're a, if you're a standalone ground ambulance organization that basically just does ground ambulance, then if you were to go back through all of the expenses you reported, in section seven through 11, and you added them all up, you should get about this number. If you are a fire-based organization or part of a Medicare provider of services like a hospital, this amount might be quite a bit bigger than the sum of the amounts you've reported in prior section. It depends on how you handled that allocation uh, and what method you use. Did you report a total and then a percentage, or did you do the math on your end before putting the number in? Again, either way is fine from the perspective of GADCS, but doing more of that math ahead of time before you enter information will mean that if you were to go back and sum up the numbers you've reported, they could be quite a bit less than this total cost you report in section 12. All right. I'll hit the dashboard that saved that. You'll see we're complete all the way down to this final section, section 13, which covers revenues. All right, let's hit start for section 13. Revenues is the last section. Now this is a change in focus a little bit. The first few sections handled um, organizational characteristics and information about the type and mix of services you provide. Sections seven through 12 covered expenses. And now section 13 is asking about revenue. So we start off right out the gate with section 13, question one, which is the second of two. We just answered the first of two in section 12. This is the second of two questions asking about your, the scope is asking about your entire operation, revenue from across the board. So that means not just limited to ground ambulance operations. So we reported we had total costs of a million. Let's say that we have a total revenue of 1.1 million in black, good news. So then question two asks whether we can report revenue from ground ambulance transports, specifically from individual healthcare payers like Medicare or Medicaid commercial insurance. If you hit no, then you're gonna report one revenue amount for all payers combined. If it's at all possible, CMS strongly prefers you would hit yes here. And then on the next page, you'll see there's a table that has rows for different kinds of payers. You click off the ones that you received revenue from during your data collection period. So let's say this organization had fee-for-service Medicare revenue, Medicare Advantage revenue, traditional Medicaid, managed care Medicaid, but maybe not TRICARE, say yes to VHA, yes to commercial insurance, no to workers' comp, and yes to patient self-pay. A couple of important notes here. The first one is that there's a column on the right asking whether for that row, for the amount you're going to put into total revenues, does that amount include patient cost sharing? So there are two possibilities. One is that your accounting system, as you're getting payment in for services that you're billing to Medicare beneficiaries and to Medicare, the 20% cost sharing that patients are on the hook for, if they don't have supplemental coverage, they're paying that cash, is that amount included in this number or not? If it's not included, CMS thinks chances are it's going to be included down here in the patient self-pay. So if the co the copay, the cost sharing amount for patients with some kind of coverage, 
in your system appears down here under patient self-pay cash, you'd hit no in this column on the right for that row. If it's included in this number, you'd hit yes. So I'm just going to assume that for all of these, we do in fact have a yes here. Ah, I figured out it only works if you already put in a number. Um, so let's assume that we have, uh, I actually go 200,000 for Medicare, uh, 50,000 for Medicare Advantage, 50,000 for Medicaid fee for service, 200,000 for Medicaid managed care, 500,000, 520, 820. And I'll put yes for all of these. And just to emphasize this, if there was an amount um, that, say for commercial, say for commercial insurance, the cost sharing would appear here, you'd hit no, and then this amount would likely shrink a little bit, and this amount would likely go up a little bit. All right. So this is all revenue from ground ambulance transports. A couple. Other notes here, there are cases where your organization may receive revenue from other kinds of services involving ground ambulance, treatment at the scene, um, para paramedicine, other, other related services where you may, be, you may be going to patients, providing services, um, but it's not a paid ground ambulance transport per se. If possible, CMS prefers that these numbers be limited just to ground ambulance transport revenue. You can report revenue from other kinds of services related to your EMT paramedic staff and, and ambulances. You can report those a few questions later in section 13. So still in scope would still be reported, but the preferences this information would be limited just to ground ambulance transports. I mentioned way back in section six that billing companies can provide a lot of that information in terms of the, uh, the mix of services across different types of ground ambulance transports. This is another place that for many organizations, if you're not doing billing in-house, chances are your billing company already has a report that looks along these lines that they could share with you. Hitting next, this will go to page three of four in section 13. And this is a set of questions that ask how often you bill for patients uh, with different types of coverage. You know, it's interesting, I, I think the presumption is that ground ambulance organizations will often bill when they can. Although there are some cases, say uh, due to a very low, low number, a small number of transports with a particular kind of coverage and maybe administrative hurdles to get paid um, from certain sources of coverage, you might just not bill. In other cases, there may be patients that um, you only bill sometimes, like Medicaid patients. Um, maybe if there's a strong indication that, uh, uh, that the patient may be churning in and out of Medicaid, rather than go down that route of billing and, and, um, and uh, have to end up ultimately billing a patient, you might just not bill all the time. So that might be a reason why you'd answer something other than always here. Maybe it's usually or sometimes, or as a policy at your organization, never for some of these cases. So it's important you answer each of these. If you don't have patients transported, you'd answer NA. And if you always bill, you just go down the row here and hit always. I think I said we did not have TRICARE uh, I think we said we did have VHA, no workers comp. And let's say for patient self-pay, that's a usually. In some cases, when when patients uh, aren't able to pay, there are times where uh, uh, they're not billed. Hitting next takes you to the last page of the GIDCS. And this is a lot like that last table in section 11 around other costs. 
This is other revenues. So this is any revenue that you haven't reported up to this point. The revenue you reported earlier in section 13 really only covers ground ambulance transports. And so to the extent you're bringing in revenue from your um, contractual arrangements with facilities or neighboring areas, to the extent there's uh, earmarked tax revenue coming to fund your operation, to the extent your municipality covers your expenses, there's a whole range of um, categories here. And then as in other sections, there's a write in field at the end. So let's say that we uh, primarily get, um, let's see, so we're government owned and operated. Let's say we primarily are financed out of local taxes earmarked for EMS services. Think back in question one, I indicated that our ground ambulance revenue from the different payers actually covered most of our $1 million annual expenses. But let's say that our municipality picks up the balance and we get a, a, a local taxes earmarked for EMS services of $200,000. Now, this is the last page of section 13, the last section. The only option at this point is to click finish. Oh no, this is unplanned, but a good example of how the system can help you navigate I forgot to enter the allocation percentages here. So this is another great case where we could um, either do the math ahead of time or report a uh, share here. So if this is $200,000 total coming from the municipality and that supports our overall organization, we might again, as we have in some other places, put 50% here. Hopefully that will work, it did. So now we've made it back to the dashboard. And at the bottom, you'll see a congratulations message. It says you've now completed all sections. Would you like to review or submit? I'll stop our walkthrough here. The process for reviewing is fairly straightforward. If you're submitting data, you can click on this review responses button and get a PDF to, um, to, to open and read. It's opening for me in a different window so you can't see it, but it's a nice um, uh, summary of all of your responses. If you hit submit, then your role as a data submitter ends and the role of the certifier comes into play. I won't cover that today, but I would encourage you to go back to those December 2022 webinars posted on CMS's GADCS website to review how the process works from here on out. And with that, we'll wrap up our walkthrough of the GADCS. Before we go, I'd just like to remind you of the resources available on the CMS GADCS website. Talked to these at the very beginning of today, but I'll pop them up one more time. An FAQ document that has an increasing, increasingly long list of frequently asked questions and responses. The files you need to look at to see and confirm if you're participating in year one or year two, where the reporting period for many organizations is open right now as of January, 2023. Or if you're collecting information starting at some point uh, in 2023, the year three and year four organizations. It's also that printable version of the, the ground ambulance uh, data collection system instrument that I've mentioned a couple times. Uh, it's the printable version of the questions we just walked through. The tip sheets are relatively new, posted just this month in January 2023, and offer some uh, shorter format help on different aspects that we've talked about during the walkthrough. And just want to also point out our user guide, which is a rather lengthy document walking through screens and pages in the GADCS step-by-step and the facilities and vehicles templates I mentioned earlier. The webinars, I've referenced a few of them today during the walkthrough, um, and I do wanna call your attention specifically to the December 8 and December 15 webinars that give you more information on the IT account and system side of all of this, as well as at the end of completing your submission, which we walked through, the certifier role 
and how to wrap up your organization submission to CMS. So with that, and on behalf of CMS, I'd like to thank you for watching through this walkthrough and best of luck to everyone in collecting and reporting your information to GADCS. Thank you.